It's a privilege to be speaking with you all here tonight, and I'm thankful to have generous colleagues that I have and everyone here at SITE, and we're fortunate to have such a forward-thinking institution in our hometown. I'm afraid to list names, as I might forget someone, but for the record, I love everyone at SITE, and I look forward to future collaborations, especially next year when the New Mexico Museum of Art opens our new building in the rail yard, and when we will truly be neighbors. And I promise the whole talk isn't gonna be shout outs and congratulations. Um, so this talk is called The Science of Feeling, and The Science of Feeling is a little tongue in cheek. Oh wait, I need to show some slides. So and this is the first time I've done a live talk in almost three years. So bear, I might be a little rusty. Um, so Helen Pashkin, The Science of Feeling, the title of this show is a little, of this talk is a little tongue in cheek. Is, it, is referring to the actual scientific qualities of California light, which people like Lawrence Weschler have written and spoken about, and, the significant, and the, its significance to the artwork produced on the West Coast. I also wanted to hint at the counterculture and the idea of feeling through seeing um, and experiencing, and the impact of high-tech industrial materials on artistic production in the West Coast. And really, I'm talking about the 1960s at this time. To be with Helen Passion's work is an experience that envelops our entire body. We feel her sculptures as much as we see them. Capturing and realizing in many ways what the Transcendental Painting Group, which predates the light and space movement by a few decades and was founded here in the Southwest, described in their manifesto as a desire to cre art, create art that was beyond the appearance of the physical world, through new concepts of space, color, light, and design, to imaginative realms that are both idealistic and spiritual. The light and space artists, of which Pashkin is a significant member, are noted for the use of new materials and emerging technologies available in post-war California. This, their artwork is often discussed as merging the innovations made and used by the aerospace industry and other advanced industries with the culture of the region, notably surfing and car culture. Finnish fetish, cool school, those are also terms sometimes used to describe the art coming from California at this time. The American West is, a, is an area often associated with opportunity, a place it was also thought to be, a place, um, it's, a, it's a place. Um, it was also at the end of the war an area where new materials, research and development were going on, a place of the future, seemingly not bogged down by the history and open to alternatives in medicine, lifestyle, and artist materials. This attitude, environment, and material allowed the artist to create works that were physically and conceptually different. Like many artists from the West or who made their way to the West and Southwest in the 20th century, these artists were striving to create works beyond the representational, to move beyond the strictly visual, to exploit perception, and to create artworks that were experienced as much as they were seen. Um, and then these just give a little context of California kind of in the 50s and 60s, a little Bridget Bardot on the Sunset Strip, and the fantastic theme restaurant at LAX, which kind of talks about how LA imagined itself at that time. So, and then here is the really terrible slide of my feet in the installation to <laughs> double enforce that you really need to be in this work to see it and experience and to know it. So, many of us have already heard Lawrence Weschler, Michael Govan, and David Chickie, as well as Helen Pashkin, or Pashkin herself, speak about the work with more direct knowledge than I have. So my thought was to divide this talk into sections. And in keeping with the works in the exhibition, this is the last shout out, beautifully curated by Brande Keoba, these, uh, the, these sections of the talk have permeable borders, so they kind of meld in and out of one another. I would like to look at the cultural context the work grew out of, look at the work in relationship to a few of Helen's colleagues, and I hope to support my belief that the West and the Southwest are locations of possibility. Artists and others who've come to the West do so for many reasons, but it's often in search of radical change 
opportunity, escape, and for the light. A few are lucky enough to be born in the West and Southwest, like Helen Pashkin and myself. Um, and, you know, as an example, my family, my, the patriarchs on my father's side and my great-grandfather, one came to work for Cecil B. DeMille and the other came to be a miner. Um, so, you know, go California. <clears throat> so Helen Paschen was born in 1934 in Pasadena. She studied art and art history at Pomona College with Seymour Slive from 1952 to 1956. Slive was an important influence on Paschen. Uh, his expertise were the Dutch masters, and after studying with Slive, um, Helen went on to New York to study at Columbia for a year in 56, and in 1957 moved on to Boston University where she received her master's in art history. Um, she completed her master's and began to teach in middle school for a few years rather than enter a PhD program that she was offered to join at Harvard University. She quits teaching in 1960 to pursue her art full time, at that time as a painter, and in 1963 returns to California to live by the beach. The light of California drew her back, particularly the, reflect, the refracted light she remembers from the tide pools as a child, which made a lasting impression on her, and as we know, light will later become her medium as much as the plastics and resins that she worked with. One of the earliest people to write about West Coast post-war art was Peter Plagans in his 1974 book, Sunshine and Muse the title referring to the plentiful sunshine, but also the fact that the state itself was a muse and an inspiration. This early publication about the modern art coming from the West Coast uh, posits that art rose out of a list of things, including desert air, youthful cleanliness, spatial expanse, a lack of architectural tradition outside of Irving Gill, Richard Neutra, Rudolf Schindler, and Craig Elwood, and the direct quote here is, most vaguely and most importantly, out of optimism. optimism. I agree with Plagans about the optimism. I want to point out that in this talk, I make a difference between optimism and possibility. Like Pashkin's work and like consciousness, it's hard to hint, pinpoint and define borders or locations, but we do know they exist for optimism, for passion's work, and for consciousness. California was becoming, in the 1950s and 60s, was booming. Population was growing, high-tech and aerospace industries were moving us into the future. Case study houses in Disneyland all pointed to an optimistic future. Like modernism, there was a belief in a newer, that newer meant better, advancement meant progress, and the tools and chemistry derived, derived from the war industry, research at Caltech, and that the Jet Propulsion Lab were seen as positive, leading us to a brighter future. I'm including these two images here of works by artists from the West Coast, abstract classicists John McLaughlin and Frederick Kammersley. I'm including these for a couple reasons. First, they're two great paintings in the Museum of Art collection. Um, and second, because I think they reflect some of this optimism. Also, because both Frederick Hammersley and John McLaughlin were teaching at Pomona College at the time that Helen Paschen was a student there. Um, also, because their work is very representative of the difference between East Coast and West Coast work at the, t at the turn of the century. So here we have um, McLaughlin and Hammersley, two of the four abstract classicists, and then for contrast here, I have an Elaine de Kooning East Coast abstract expressionist work from 59 uh, next to a Carl Benjamin piece called Inter from 67. The abstract classicists were cool, composed, balanced, and restrained, and on the West Coast. The East Coast abstract expressionists were brash, emotive, and frenetic. The West Coast abstract classicists are giving us the visual equivalence to cool jazz and the open quality of the modern architecture. Oh wait, that's two slides away. He, um, I also want to take a second to make a simplified comparison, as if the one before wasn't simplified too, of East Coast and West Coast minimalism. Minimalism is often the art movement that light and space artists are discussed in relationship to. Here I'm showing two artists' works from the pivotal exhibition, Primary Structures. 
This was held at the Jewish Museum in New York in 1966 and introduced and helped to define minimal and reductive art internationally. While the East Coast works borrowed from industry and manufacturing, the West Coast aesthetic and minimalism can be characterized by clean lines, simple shapes, but also pristine, reflective, or translucent surfaces, and often the use of bright, seductive colors and, as mentioned previously, high-tech materials. So here we have the Robert Morris Untitled. This is not, these are not images from the Primary Structures Exhibition since it was in 66, they're all in black and white, but I found the same objects in color. Um, and you can see that there's a brightness to the Judy Chicago work that's not in the Robert Morris. Also, it's not as well illustrated in these two choices, um, but there weren't that many West Coast people in the Primary Structures Exhibition. Um, but there's a difference between the, the industry that they're looking towards. It feels like the East Coast work is a lot more tied to factory manufacture, whereas the West Coast work is more tied to chemistry and um, uh, technical advancement. <coughs> so uh, steel furnaces, and I got creative here, steel furnaces and cranes versus jet labs and lab coats. Uh, these seductive colors and surfaces were often considered less serious. Art in California was still considered frivolous, if not a wasteland, to most of the art establishment. So this is an early 1968 sphere by Helen Passion. The, um, the primary structures show took place in 66. This was a pivotal year for Helen Passion, as that was also the year that she made her first polyester resin sculpture, utilizing a kit from a craft store. From a craft store. Later, um, I learned one thing working, you need to number your pages. Um, uh, later, the artist would work directly with, with chemists and manufacturers and a longtime collaborator and fabricator and technical ex expert, Jack Brogan. These early small works were often set in plexiglass boxes, multiplying the reflections, but also frustrating and breaking the view. Collaboration between the high-tech industries and artists and scientists were the inspiration for two programs in California in the late 1960s. LA County Museums of Art knew at the time curator Maurice Tuckman, transplanted from New York to LA, created an art and technology program, and Caltech created its CIT, California Institute of Technology, residence program in Pasadena. The LA County Art and Tech program ran from 1967 to 1971, Tuckman's group included artists like Andy Warhol, Robert Rauschenberg, Richard Serra, Robert Irwin, and James Terrell, and they worked with corporations and research centers like Lockheed, IBM, Teledyne, Ampex, and also Kaiser Steel, Universal Studios, and the Jet Propulsion Lab. Passion was part of the, oh, and that program was recently resurrected at LA County, so they have a new art and technology program now. Passion was an artist in residence at California Institute of Technology from 1969 to 1971. The only woman invited to participate in either of the art and technology programs at the time. Passion and artist Peter Alexander were among the artists in residence working with the chemical engineering department. Passion was been, had been working on her own, creating small sculpture using polyester resin and began experimenting with incorporating small rods and inclusions. For the CIT program final exhibition, Pashkin created four three-foot discs on high pedestals and a five-foot round disc. And here you can see her polishing one of the three-foot discs, and here polishing, obviously, the much larger five-foot disc. Um, so she had been working. So uh, so just the CID program, she was working, so she was working on this large disc for, the exhi for their final exhibition in the gallery at Caltech when Peter Alexander realized she was never going to get this sanded down in time. She describes the piece in a um, Getty Center interview that she had cast what was essentially a thick pancake and had planned to send it, sand it down into the shape of a lens. These works are the precursors to the lenses that we see in the Santa Fe, in the site Santa Fe exhibition. So here's some pictures of, early picture of Helen with Jack Brogan, and then a more recent picture of Helen working in her studio on one of the new discs. And then 
this, these photos I stole from the Radius book, so thank you, Radius, and sorry I stole your pictures. Um, these lenses are now created by casting, by casting them flat on the table, pouring thin layers of subtle and transparent color, color utilizing a less, to less toxic and more stable epoxy resin. They're shown with controlled lighting and sequence timing. The use of thin layers of colors harken back to the artist's studies of the Dutch masters and the use of glazing in traditional painting. So this is a quote from a recent art form out article, a quote from Helen Passion. So here, oh, first, here's a side view of one of the lenses. I know all of you have seen the show, but you can see the very thinness of the edge. And then this is a frontal view. And then while I read uh, Helen's quote, I'm gonna just put full screen one of the um, diffused images of the lenses. Um, some people, f this is Helen, and I don't know why I call her Helen, because I haven't met her. But um, some people find my lens works very mesmerizing. They tell me that when the lights go up real high and then come down again, we know it's going to be the same color, but they feel they've changed themselves. So they're looking in a different way. Some people see color moving all around the walls because it can expand your per perception. The timing of the light cycle gives your brains and eyes time to catch up and then readjust. The other thing about the lenses that everyone comments on is their calming. In the frenetic, broken world we live in, when everything else is fast and digital, this is the opposite. It's quiet, it's timeless, and it does things to people. This is still Hel uh, the quote from Art History, I mean from uh, Art Forum. It's about what light and space is all about, which is perception and the phenomenon of really having an experience, not just an observation. Once you stop trying to find an edge, we always want to know where we are to feel safe. Then relax and you're looking at pure color. It's okay to say what you feel. No people, two people will feel the same. Um, I'm gonna run into this next image of the columns that are up in this exhibition and then a kind of a sequence showing the timing of um, the shift in light over the time sequence. So Kirk Varnado, in his book, Pictures of Nothing, Abstract Art Since Pollock, describes this type of work and this type of viewing experience as embodying, quote, points of uncertainty and, quote, disembodied experience. This is because the artist working in plastics, and I'm talking really today just about the artist working on sculpture, platform, mounted pieces, not the artists who are working in large-scale work large-scale room environments and things, because that is a whole other related, but whole other story. So <clears throat> these artists working in plastics were engaged not simply in optical effects, but also, and maybe more importantly, they were calling upon the viewer's subtle and slowed down perception in order to break away from the constraints of the physical dimension or borders of their work and engage the objects in the, their surroundings as well as engaging the viewer. Um, a local writer, uh, Tanya Catan, mentioned to me after coming to this show that she had been to the lecture and she's heard these discussions about the light and the water at the beach and also um, you know, how amazing it is that Helen is, Passion is, is surfing at such an advanced age. But she said what struck her looking in, at the large pink lens was nobody was talking about how the light and the movement of the sculpture felt like the waves, you know, a back and forth um, through which, you know, the way the earth breathes and it's uh, also breath is central to uh, meditation. So I thought that was a really interesting insight. And in addition to breath, there's also this notion of duration that comes with the timed lighting which I'm not gonna get into here, but relates quite a bit to um, video and, and other kind of performative things that were starting to emerge in Southern California at that time. So, light and space created sculpture that addressed the, arts, the art object's environment, worked in relationship to, its, to it, reflecting, defining. No two views can be replicated. Where you were standing, what you were wearing, the light conditions in the time of day outside the windows at Charlotte Jackson's gallery 
sorry, there was one more shout out. Uh, all, in par all impact the view slash experience. And this is one of the core things that Light and Space artists chose to take the entire environment into consideration with the work, dissolving the edges of the artwork into something amorphous and unstructured. So next, I have a couple of examples of um, other two other artists working on pedestal-based works at the same time, and that is Peter Alexander and Larry Bell. Um, like most of the other light and space artists, they were based out of Venice, California. Uh, Helen was based in uh, Pasadena. And this first piece is a very early cloud box by Peter Alexander, and I'm showing two views of the same work because you can see the difference between the work on the same exact pedestal but strictly with just a different shift in background, the dark and the light. So, uh, uh, Bell and Alexander's work, to me, feels more confined. It's confined to the space that they're defining um, with, for instance, Larry Bell does these uh, glass, at the time was doing these glass cubes, glass with various uh, vaporized materials on the surface, but, can, but the, you were looking through and looking in and light was reflecting off of these, but you're still looking at in a way that you don't look at the Pashkins. Um, and then also, you could say the same for Larry Bell's work. Peter Alexander was also a California native. This is a Peter Alex these are Peter Alexander's works. He was born in 39, passed away in 2020. He was a member of the Light and Space Movement, but also, and also an artist in residence at Caltech with Pashkin through 69 to 71. Most of his well-known works are resin and plastic pieces. He discovered the signature media while he noticed the translucent disc left in the Dixie cup after repairing his surfboard. Due to the toxicity of the materials, he stopped using resin for a couple of decades, uh, returning uh, a couple of later years, a couple of decades later to continue to make more works in epoxy resin. Alexander, it's interesting to note, started as an architect before developing a reputation in the 1960s for creating his sculpture and before getting an MFA at UCLA. He also, of interest, worked in Neutra's architectural office. Larry Bell was born in 1939 in Chicago and raised in California. He studied at Chouinard, where Frederick Hammersley also studied. It's known for his glass boxes and vapor drawings and main maintains a studio in Venice, California and also a studio up here in Taos. And there's quite a lot of crossover between artists who lived and worked in California and who live here either part-time or full-time um, in New Mexico, not necessarily Santa Fe. All the examples of artwork I've been shown are pulled from the date range from about 1957 to 1971 aside from the Pashkins. The thinking being that in the mid-1960s, the beginning of the light and space movement and the time period also embodied some of the optimism that Peter Plagan spoke of. In the late 1960s in California, the weight of the Vietnam War, <clears throat> the, Manson fam the Manson family, the Watts uprising, and the assassination of Robert Kennedy in Los Angeles at the Ambassador Hotel, <coughs> I don't know why that always makes me sad, began to take their toll on the optimism um, and brought, into the, brought the arts in California to the dystopia that Mike Davis kind of began to refer to in his book, City of Quartz as Sunshine and Noir. The muse has been replaced by darkness. And this brought forward more pessimistic work by artists like Chris Burden and Mike Kelly. And um, I love this Catholic print box, Birdhouse with the easy way and the hard way. Um, so, uh, so, in, so anyway, but instead of leaving us on a downer, um, I have one more slide. Let's revel in the sunshine muse and forget about the noir for a moment. Let's celebrate the exhibit, what 88-year-old Helen Pashkin refers to as her mid-career retrospective. And I call that optimism, and ambition. So uh, please, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. And um, I want to thank you for being here.